All right. So technically, we are live. Um, but anyone who's seen one of these shows before would have played the same game over and over again, which is where we start streaming, and then we check that we're actually visible live. So uh, just give us one second, folks, and then we're going to get then we're going to get started. So uh, let me just check myself. Make sure everything's up and running. Otherwise, we'll be talking into silence. All oh, right. So it's okay, I can hear my rather infuriating voice. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is John Bacon. I work as the Ubuntu Community Manager at Canonical. And welcome to uh, a show in which we're going to be talking about Ubuntu 13.10. So Ubuntu 13.10 is now out. After six months of furious development on this particular release, but really a much longer period of time of development on, for example, the phone, uh, we're delighted to present Ubuntu 13.10 across the desktop, the server, the phone, and the cloud. Um, so the goal with Ubuntu is to build a single conversion operating system that runs across all of these different devices. It will run on, it will run on the devices in your pocket, on your wall, on your desk. Uh, as well as, in the, of course, in the cloud uh, and, and in your data center. So 13.10 is a phenomenal release. Um, it's, it's really brought together the, the engineering talent in, in Canonical and the community and a wide variety of upstreams as well. Um, and uh, I think it was Daniel had the brilliant idea of, why don't we have a session online where we can just provide some demos of what's in 13.10 to give everybody a good idea of, of where it stands. Now, this is difficult. The caveat here is that, Ubuntu does so many different things, and arguably we would need an entire day to show everything that it can do across all these different form factors um, and platforms. So, so we're really going to be focusing on the new things today. Um, but if you want to try it all for yourself, the place to go is Ubuntu.com. If you go to Ubuntu.com, you can find out more about, about running Ubuntu on your desktop, on your phone, on your server, and of course in the cloud as well. So, without further ado, my goal here is to is to be as quiet as possible and to really focus on on everyone here who's going to be providing the demos. So, uh, before I get started, just wanted to provide a quick introduction to everybody. So, we've got Daniel Holback, who works in the community team. Daniel's been working on the Click side of things and the app developer story, working with the XDA community. Uh, George Castro is is working building the Juju community and, and a large community of charmers. Uh, Kevin Gunn is the engineering manager for Mir and for Unity. Um, obviously, Mir has been a heavy focus in the cycle, and it's running awesomely on the phone. Uh, Martin Albacetti has been heavily involved in the in the app developer story. The fact that you can get applications in, into Ubuntu and on the phone is in large part due to his excellent efforts. Um, if you're interested in app development for Ubuntu, you're going to be more than familiar with the next person. Michael Hall has been leading much of the efforts there. Uh, Pat McGowan has been running much of the operations in terms of how we build the phone, uh, handling customer requirements and all kinds of pieces that, 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 that have gone into building the phone. Uh, Tom Estrell has been uh, heavily involved in the indicators and the system services side of Unity. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, I'm just here, hanging on. I'm, I'm basically the hired help. So uh, anyway, without further ado, let's, let's get cracking. The very first demo we're going to focus on right now, I'm going to hand over to Daniel, which is going to be demonstrating uh, the, the the new app up upload pro pro uh, process and click packages. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jono. Uh, it's good to be here with Martin and being able to finally show this off. Like, it's been up and running for 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 quite a while now, but it's a lot more beautiful now. Uh, so, I'll start with sharing my screen. So. Um, Martin, Roberto, and I had a quick chat yesterday, and we... Can you see this? Shall yeah. I increase the font, or is it all right? It looks great. Perfect. So uh, we thought we would just put together a quick app which solves the biggest problem we have on, on touch, which is um, people need to be able to view pictures of random cats on the internet. So um, I just put in... Um, basic information on this page. Um, oh, this is a bit unexpected. Hang on. Oh, 
Ah, here we are. Sorry. Let me try again. Random cat. Okay. Okay. Uh, this will need a bit of hackery now. Oh, can you, Martin? Can you maybe have a look at this upload? Well, I think you 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 went, did the process halfway through, so you registered the package, but never. Yeah. So I can. I can delete it for you if you want. Do you want to show yeah. people in Git Creator how you created the click package in the meantime? Yeah, I can uh, quickly show off what the app does. Let's um, we do that. So I, what I, oh, hang on. I need to share my screen first. So what I did, I started off with um, an app called Random Image, which did almost what I wanted. But um, if you have a look at the QML bits, this is one page of code, and this is the second part of it. That's, uh, if you're going to see it in, in, in just a while, we're going to show it on the, on the device. There's not a lot of actual code involved in, in this example. And we have just a little bit of, of JavaScript, which gets um, the, the cat goodness from, from the internet. And that's all that's involved. It's just that easy and that beautiful. You should be uh, good to go. Good to go. Perfect. Yeah, sorry about that. I think I know what happened there. So this is just go for trying to plan ahead. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So I just go back here again, random cats, define the package name and the tagline, and we're back in the game. Okay. Accessories, that's Good, a quick description. Cats, low cats. Fun. Okay, you can here in, this, in the store you can see that um, we have lots of different options. Um, so you could just make sure that, that uh, an app is just shipped in, in some countries, or it's excluded from being shipped in, in some countries. Uh, you can specify hardware requirements. All of this hard work went into the store in, in just the, the last few weeks. It's just uh, brilliant to, to, to see this up and running. Next, we'll focus on the visuals. I put together a, a random cat. Where is it? Yeah, this will do. Okay. Next up is license and support. Uh, people will, will email me. Okay. Check this under the GPL, and now we can um, we can upload the app. Specify the, the version and pick the application. Put this here somewhere. All right. Don't forget ah. to specify the change log. This is okay. something new. You hadn't seen this yet. No, this is new. This is, the... this is so developers can tell users what's changed. All right. Yep, it's uploaded. And here we can check if everything is all right. This looks pretty good to me. And 
we want this to be automatically published once uh, it passed the review. So we're submitting it for review. And here I'm going to hand over to Martin. OK, so let's take over. Um, let me share my screen with you. There you go. <clears throat> so we're going to refresh the pending application for review. Aha, we see there's a couple of submissions, but let's just focus on Daniels for now, which is random cats. So we can look through what he submitted, and we are going to start the review. Uh, gives me a bunch of technical details around what he's uploaded. So what, what I'm going to do is, because we haven't yet uploaded it, we haven't yet automated reviews, I'm going to download this to my desktop. And I'm going to show you how I review this. So let me change this. I'm going to take you to my terminal. All right, so this should be downloaded. So, so the review script is open source. Um, so you can run it yourself on your apps before submitting it. So basically, this is how you run it. It does many, many checks. And it says it's, it has failed. So let's see. Why has it failed? I'm sure Daniel, right. So Daniel said in his package that this was an RMHF app, but then he told the story it was uh, an application for all architectures. So did I so, the wrong, yes, the wrong did. button there? Right. So what you have to do now is upload a new version and specify RMHF as your architecture, because that's what your click package told you. OK, I can do that. This is because Daniel did not run the link tool before submitting. This, by the way, is not going to be an issue soon, because we're going to scan your package for you so you don't have to duplicate the information. We'll just extract it from the click package so you don't have to remember to coordinate what you specified in click package and what you're specifying in the web UI. All right. So I just uh, up updated the version. And um, on this page, I want to resubmit. Right, you want to upload a new version. All right. OK. So I've never done this before. Um, ah, here we go. Upload a new version. OK. This is order 2. It's a small architecture issue. OK, so this time, ah. And I'm going to pick the file, and that's here. Now save the changes, upload, upload complete. OK, so let me. Share my screen with you again. All right, so let's take a look. Daniel's app should be up for review again. Indeed, it is. So let's start the review again. We are going to download this 0.2. It now says RMHF, so that should be fine. Now let me take you to my terminal. I think it should be within my terminal, so we're going to change this to 0.2. And our script says this passes. 
So I am going to approve this. Switch again. Okay, so I'll paste the passing message and approve. So this is now live on the store. If you have an Ubuntu Touch um, phone, you should be able to get random cats from the internet. Fantastic. Do you want to show this yeah, off, let me, let me see if, it, if this works. So I have a, a Nexus 7 here running uh, revision 100, which is the 13.10 release. Let me see if we can make this work. So here is a list of loads and loads of apps. Oh, sorry, I bit hard to navigate uh, when you're looking at it from this angle. So uh, here are a bunch more suggestions. So maybe search for cat because yeah, I will, I will search for it. Look at that, Jono. Jono did it faster than. You. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to install I'm it. it now. <laughs> All right. You have to show people how this works, right? Yeah. So I just hit the install button. It downloaded it very, very quickly, and it's just now going through the registration steps. And now we can hit open. And here we go. I just hit the random cat button and Yay. there are random, cats. random cats. What's really beautiful about this process is how quick it all is. Like, uh, it took Martin just a few s seconds to, to uh, run the script to make sure that uh, everything is according to, to our standards. Uh, it runs confined, um, and it's just available within milliseconds, which is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So there's been, um, I don't know, probably 40, 50 people working on it on the server side, on Click itself, on um, integrating this in, into um, Ubuntu for phone, and uh, it was it was hectic at times. It was crazy at times, but uh, I'm, I'm super happy we, we are where we are, and it, it's just fantastic. It was loads of hard work. So, Thank well you. Done, everyone. Now, go and build apps. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. fastest we've ever gotten an app in Ubuntu. I mean, that was excellent. I think, I think a lot of people who haven't been around Ubuntu or Linux for a while probably don't realize how limiting it used to be. Uh, so how revolutionary this is for us. So uh, thank you to everyone for all of your efforts. It's been a, it, this is such an important piece that's going to be fundamental in our success. All right, thank you for a demo. Um, so next up is going to be Pat, uh, and Pat's going to be talking about um, Ubuntu for phones. Yeah, hey. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things uh, specifically. One is um, what people can expect over the next month or so um, with the release and updates. Um, we're obviously going to keep moving on. Uh, we've got a lot more work to do, and that's the other thing I wanted to touch on. So um, things aren't going to stand still. We're going to march right into T and, and keep uh, enhancing the, the platform. But uh, for the next while, you, you people will see updates to the 1310 phone uh, version that's released. Um, any kind of critical bugs that are fixed in the platform will come through. Um, a lot of the code is common between the desktop and the, uh, the phone image. So, and, you know, anytime anything gets uh, fixed in the base, that will come through in an update. Um, and maybe anything critical that we deem important enough to, to push out as an SRU. But um, people should also know that we're expecting folks to move on to the, the first stable versions in uh, the T release as soon as possible. So the channel to get updates on stable will ultimately start pulling from um, the next uh, distro version from T. Um, and so probably maybe in a month or so, that's uh, people who want to get the latest stuff should, move, uh, should start seeing it come from there. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the things, you know, not to uh, 
sit on our rest on our laurels too much. There is a lot of stuff that we we're going to move to do um, to do next that, that we didn't get to. Um, so there's going to be improvements in the scopes area, which Thomas could talk about a lot more. But just basically how we we manage scopes and how they're installed and um, make them feel a little bit more like we treat applications, you know, so that it's easier to manage them. Um, for the the dash, there's still a lot of stuff left to do that Kevin could tell us about. Where you know we need to add categories. Um, we're going to do um, full rotation of, of the dash and, and the, um, all the, uh, the whole unit experience. Uh, we're going to add back the side stage support in here and things like that. So lots of stuff coming in the dash area. Uh, for services, there's still things we, did, we need to go back and finish. Um, the music service, the time, time zone service using um, NITS. Um, we're going to do some work on sensors and cameras so that we don't have direct access over to the Android side and we're going to do some refactoring there. So uh, so definitely some stuff to do in the services area. As far as applications, there's a few features that, that we'll uh, finish up. Uh, downloads and uploading in the, um, in the browser, um, contacts and calendar syncing, and attachments in text messages uh, using SFMMS. Um, the other thing in the browser area, there's we're looking at migrating the solution over time over to the Chromium Content API, um, which is also the approach that Qt is looking at upstream for the uh, <coughs> new Qt web engine. So that would um, allow us to track the improvements in the rendering engine and, and other things and, and give us a nice abstraction layer to, to program to. Um, soon we'll, we'll go back to updating the base version of Qt that we're using. We're on 5.0 5 today. We're going to move probably to 5.2. Some great improvements are coming from upstream there. Um, and we just recently saw a post about some great rendering improvements in the scene graphing implementation. Um, and just in general, some better integration for our applications with Unity, uh, finishing up some of the web apps work so that it's better integrated um, and looks more like uh, we've had in the desktop in the past. So lots, lots of good stuff yet to come. Um, great base release that people can start to, to um, test and make plans with, and then more stuff coming soon. And um, Rick Spencer actually made a great blog post um, summarizing everything that got accomplished. So I encourage people to go take a look at that at uh, Raving Rick uh, at blogs, uh, blogspot.com. That's about it. Thank you, Pat. Um, so you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, the scope side of things. I think we're going to move on to Thomas now, who's going to provide an overview of what smart scopes is, why people should care, and what has arrived in thirteen ten across the desktop and phone. Okay, thanks, Jono. So uh, while we have most of the reviews so far have been uh, centered around the phone uh, for the scopes, it's actually much more what we have. So um, after we missed the deadline for 4304, we finally made it 41310. And the big news there is introducing really the smart scope server. So what it is is um, if you're used to scopes so far, then all the scopes run basically locally. So you get uh, information about your local files. Uh, locally stored music, videos, and all that stuff. We also had some scopes which also query remove data, and, and that works quite well. But there are some disadvantages with that. Um, so what we introduced is what we call a smart scope server. So imagine that as being a server somewhere, and we just send requests to that. So your search query will end up there, uh, only the search query. So we don't really store IP information or, or even trans transform transmit that. Uh, so we try to be as um, as lean as possible in that way to prevent any privacy concerns. The smart scope server then, based on the the query it gets, it does multiple things. So first of all, it tries to figure out, well, have I seen that query before? And if so, what might be a good result, what you're actually looking for? And uh, depending on that, uh, it gives back recommendations. And uh, recommendations are twofold. It can be things like, you know, hey, you might want to query scope A or B even locally because, you know, if something looks like it's a file, then maybe it's a file and you search, search, search locally. So we, we don't uh, uh, search remotely, obviously, or fast. 
the other part what we return is then results directly from the smart scope server. The latter happens because we also run a lot of scopes not only locally but on the server. So imagine like you know everything usually what only queries remote data sources so anything you find on the internet we kind of proxy if you will on the smart scope server with normal scopes and basically um, return the results then to your to your normal desktop or phone. That has some advantages so first of all it's uh, pretty lean when it comes to the traffic uh, so you know if you do a search on the internet uh, then in the traditional model you would get a lot of results and those results will then sort in the scopes infrastructure on the device to figure out which ones we want to actually display or not and by doing all that on the server we sort out the not so good results on the server already and only transmit the results which are most relevant. The other big advantage what we have is that the server is obviously completely independent of any um, cycle we have, any release cycle. So that means we can push at any time improvements or new scopes to the smart scope server and uh, every consumer out there immediately benefits from that. So you know you don't have to deal with your normal device and updating, upgrading, installing new ones, etc. You get all just for free. So that is the, the, the big news uh, when it comes to smart scopes. So everything is available on the desktop as it is on the phone. Uh, it's fully converged. Um, I can try to screen share. It works. So by hitting super you get basically the scope as you're used to and then if you type just a city name whatever try to figure out hey what it is. So we, you get some results for music, uh, you can say like well maybe uh, you want to further refine the search so we give you results and hey you might want to further search in the Google News or some books or in Groove Shark etc or you might want to buy some music uh, which has Berlin in the title you can get or can check the weather, info, uh, weather forecast for the next couple of days etc. Um, if you really know what your what you're already searching, you can also do direct scope searches. So what you can type is weather column Berlin and then immediately you get basically directly all the scope results from, from the weather scope. So that's um, a neat feature. Uh, that is something we, we further build up. Um, the scope, what you're seeing, that runs on the server, so it's instant. And um, yeah, it, it just works. And with that, we also will obviously welcome everybody to contribute more and more scopes. The scopes we have on the server uh, are mostly implemented in Python. We paid attention that um, the API is the same, meaning if you're a scope author, you implement your scope against a certain scopes API, and uh, you don't really care as a scope author where your scope in the end runs. So the API and everything is the same as it runs locally or on the server in the end. So that's uh, very important for us but also makes developers lives easy. Um, that also means um, performance wise if it's a web scope uh, we try to run as many scopes as possible on the server. Um, historically a lot of scopes have been written in Python and uh, Python is not exactly uh, the most performant thing to run on a phone so by having the smart scope server we also solve that problem. Yeah so the dash as you can see on the desktop, that's the old model. Um, on the phone, what you see, uh, switch back to the screen share. I was actually just, uh, while you were talking about that, I just did the same search, Thomas, for Berlin. And obviously you get, hang on a second. Yeah. There we go. So this is the same search for Berlin. So the point, the point being, very hard doing this, uh, that you get exactly the same, you get the same experience on the phone as well as on the desktop. So that again, part of the convergence of smart scopes is available across these different devices. And the only difference is that on on the phone, you know, all what you see is basically the dash. 
and um, whereas on the desktop we still have to open it. Uh, let's see how we converge that still for 1404. Um, yeah. So the scopes are mostly the same. Uh, we do have some differences. Uh, so currently the local music uh, scope on the on the desktop is slightly different to the one on the device. Uh, so on the device we have our own backends uh, that basically utilizing the media scanner, which we reported a couple of times before. So we, we got it perfectly working now. Uh, we retrieve album art from the internet if you upload your music to the device. We cache that when you reboot your device, etc. So all that is working. We implemented our, our our own thumbnailer if you upload videos to show those in, in the videos page. Um, we have a remote video scope which uh, also queries or, or retrieves videos from different sources, Vimeo, YouTube, etc. Um, and, and those will also obviously at some point be available for the desktop. So that's the, the scope story. Um, try it out, play around, um, give us feedback. Uh, we will further improve that as we move forward. Uh, so currently the capabilities are a little bit limited when we display things so we get kind of just flat uh, results and we want to enhance that as we go forward for 14.04 to introduce what we call departments, uh, think of it like categories. So if you have a, a Amazon scope you can actually have your, your clothes books and, and all those kind of categories uh, or even you know more importantly for the click scope so that for uh, that we have a proper or can mirror a proper application shop or app store with different genres etc so that's what we will all do for 1404 um, that will trigger some changes in the API I think uh, but we try to keep those at a minimum Thank um, you, um, just before we finish up on the scope side of things, I just wanted to highlight developer.ubuntu.com as well. If, uh, Thomas mentioned that people are welcome to contribute scopes. So one of the things that we've been focusing on in this cycle is to, is to build a comprehensive developer portal across all of, these different, uh, all of these different form factors and devices. So you can see up here, you can click on scopes, and then we've got details about what scopes are. There's an overview. Um, of how the technology works, um, and then there is a full tutorial, um, as well as an API and, and the cookbook as well. Likewise, if you're interested in writing apps, you know we have details about uh, about how um, how you can write applications using HTML5 or QML, um, and then we again have full tutorials and API documentation for QML. HTML5 API documentation is coming soon. So. If you're interested in writing a scope, uh, then, or you're interested in writing an app, just go to developer.ubuntu.com and everything, everything should be there for you. So, um, speaking of writing applications, um, this rather neatly segues on to our next guest. Uh, in this cycle, we had a huge number of community members participate in what we called the Core Apps Campaign, which was getting um, the core applications for the phone built. So that was going to be calendar, calculator, weather, things like that. Uh, one of the people who's been heavily involved in running this program, which has been tremendously successful, is Michael Hall, who's going to talk about core apps and maybe give us a few demos as well. Right. <clears throat> so if you've been following uh, me or the weekly updates that we've been doing, then you, you know all about the progress we've been making on the core apps lately. Um, they are now all converted to the new click packages and installed by default in the phone image. And because they're all click packages now, we'll also be able to deliver updates to just the apps through the App Store itself. So the same way you would get updates to third-party apps, you'll get updates to the core apps also. All of the core apps have effectively reached their 1.0 milestone. They've uh, hit the functionality targets we set for them initially and in a lot of cases gone well beyond it also. Uh, we had a huge, huge number of work items uh, for the apps. I think it doubled or tripled since the uh, initial list that we put together, and 87% uh, of them are now done. So that's a, a huge accomplishment for a group of community contributors working in their spare time for no pay. Um, like I said, they've all effectively reached 1.0. We're going to start talking about uh, planning 2.0 features uh, in the next UDS. 
which is coming in mid-November. So if you want to participate in those discussions and get involved in the core app development, I encourage you to go there and participate. Um, I did just some real quick kind of on a napkin calculations, but we had almost 100 different contributors uh, submit something to the core apps projects. So actual code, tests, images, uh, anything like that. So that, that's a huge number of people that, that have been working on this, and it really comes through when you actually play with the apps themselves. And on that note, seeing uh, Daniel and Jono struggle to uh, use their phone with their regular camera, I've gone and gotten my second one. So that's no, good. look at you, yeah. fancy pants. <laughs> All right, so can everyone see this, more or less? Yeah. All right. So here's uh, some of the core apps that I've got open right now. Not really in focus, that you'll be able to see. All right, so here's the Shorts app, which is our RSS reader. You can see it's kind of got a grid of story icons that you can scroll through and pull up the actual article itself. Um, toolbar at the bottom, you can either save a site or save an article that you want to read later, or you can go open it up in the original site. Um, the music app has recently gotten a huge facelift, and it looks amazing. Um, brand new toolbar. I don't know if you guys can hear. The audio is clearly working. Uh, let's see. The weather app, pulling uh, from open weather map. You can see it is still ridiculously hot here in Florida and flip through to different days and see just how ridiculously hot it's going to be. And you can even slow scroll through um, within a day. I'm not sure you can see on this screen, but at the top it'll actually show you different times of the day and what the weather is going to be for those different times of day. Um, you can add locations. It's even got GPS lookup working, so you can scan for location and it'll pick up uh, the nearest city to you. The calendar's working. It's got, um, actually, I guess it's had this new look for a while now. But you can flip through. Um, we've got integration now with the Evolution Data Service backend, which is going to let it integrate with the date time indicator. Um, and also, that means it'll use the same backend as everything in the desktop uses. You can see you've got day view, month view, year view, week view. the ability to uh, add events to it also. The calculator has uh, been essentially feature complete for a while now. Let's see if we can see this. Um, you can save calculations. You can add labels to them if you wanted to. And it'll all be saved across the different reboots of the app. So the, the use case we generally give is if you're out you know, having a meal with friends, you can add up everybody's meal total label them, and uh, you can divide it up among you, save that calculation for later so that you can tell people, you know, hey, you still owe me money for this meal. This is how much. Uh, and then the clock, which uh, probably everybody's seen now. Um, we have alarm functionality now, which I think is working, but I haven't tried it. But it should be working now. Um, let's see. Of course, you can. There oh, we go. We've got some preset timers in here that you can use. Uh, we've got stopwatch for timing stuff. All of that's working really nicely. I think that's all I had. Yep. So, those are some of the core apps. Uh, all of them are available in the default install now. And like I said, you'll be getting updates to them uh, from the Click Store. Switch cameras back. All right. So that's uh, the update on the core apps. Uh, I just wanted to mention some other things. We've got um, 34 new apps were created for the recent Ubuntu app showdown, uh, which brings our total number of published apps in the App Store right now 
to 85. So those are just new apps using the SDK uh, for Ubuntu on phones. As far as the SDK goes, we now have a stable release of that. So it's no longer the beta version. It is official release. Uh, we have templates in Qt Creator for writing apps in QML, C++, and HTML5. We're using the Apache Cordova API to give HTML5 apps access to device sensors. This is the same API that uh, PhoneGap uses. So that'll make porting HTML5 apps to Ubuntu a lot easier. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have Qt integration with a bunch of desktop backends like Evolution Data Server. Uh, we've got it integrated to the new Media Scanner service that uh, Thomas was talking about earlier and several other places. So even though you don't notice it as a user, uh, it's really bridging the gap between mobile and desktop already as far as what it uses in the back end. Uh, and then it, as Daniel talked about, you can create a click package right from within the Qt Creator ID also. And then just uh, today, we released the new API website. So if you go to developer.ubuntu.com slash API slash QML, uh, you'll see the new API website. You can search through the API docs. Um, ah, there we go. John is sharing his screen. Everybody could see that. So right now it's all the QML API docs. Uh, we're going to keep working on this to load up HTML5 docs, Cordova docs, scopes docs. Everything we can get our hands on is going to go into this and be available from the developer portal. You've got a search functionality. So you, John, if you go search for button or search for model, that'll give you a good example. So now you can see all of the different QML components that match that search broken out into the different sections that they belong to. So like I said, that just landed today. Um, and we're going to keep working on that. If anybody's interested in helping, please get in contact with me. And then uh, if anybody's interested in keeping up with the app developer story and what's happening with app development in Ubuntu, we've got a bunch of different ways you can get involved. We have a Google Plus community. Just search for Ubuntu app developers. We have a Facebook page, which is also Ubuntu app developers. You can go like us there and uh, get updates on that. If you're on Twitter, follow at Ubuntu app devel. That's our uh, user account for that. Um, IRC, of course, is the most active. It's hash Ubuntu dash app dash devel on Freenode. And you'll find community and canonical people alike in there uh, working on apps, helping people out, come in and ask your questions. And uh, you can also ask your questions on Ask Ubuntu, which is our primary uh, support page anymore. Uh, we have a specific tag. It's application-development. So ask your question there, use that tag, and uh, somebody will get to it and provide you an answer. And that's it for my apps update. John, over. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I just want to say as well a uh, huge thank you to everyone in the community who, who contributed throughout this, particularly in, um, with the Core Apps project. But not just the Core Apps project. We, you know, we, we, we set out with an, something of an experiment to build these applications. I mean, from my experience as a community manager, I'd never seen any community project run in the same way, where you have a very defined idea of applications that you want to build, and then a community management team takes care of the project management side of things, and the community can really focus on the fun stuff, which is writing code. So to do that successfully for 11 apps was, was I think, a phenomenal undertaking, thanks to Michael, David, and other people who were involved in the team, but as well as the many, many different developers who got involved there. But not just that, we've got a really nice community of app developers building, and you know, when you go to the Google Plus app developer community, a great, that you can really see that there's a real excitement around, around this, to have 80 plus apps in the store before we even release the first version, I think is, is a real achievement. So, um, and the other thing, just before I move on to George, App development is going to be a huge focus in this coming cycle as well. We, we've just been wrapping up the planning around this, so you can expect more showdowns, a lot more focus, a lot more buzz and, and, and momentum around people building apps for Ubuntu. This is really important in helping us to be successful, um, not just on the on the phone, but converged across across the, the multiple devices as well. I posted a video recently demonstrating an application running as, as the... Uh, 
but maybe I should just show this really quick. Hang on a second. Because I think this, as we wrap up this bit, it, it really uh, helps to tell the convergence story. Let me just find the video. Um, OK, here it is. And then we'll move on to George. Let me just uh, make this full screen and screen share. Uh, OK. So um, this is a video I took of an applicant, the winner of the, of the um, Ubuntu app showdown. This is a video, this is a, an app called Karma Machine, which is a Reddit app built using the SDK. So here you can see it's connected to Reddit. I can browse the different, uh, the different subreddits. Um, so this is obviously at the phone profile. So the window is the size of a phone. This is what you see if you run it on, on, on your Ubuntu phone. Um, so I can browse different topics. I can obviously see comments. It's all really nicely laid out. It looks like an Ubuntu app. It feels like an Ubuntu app. It uses the Ubuntu font. Um, um, the author did a really good job, kind of, kind of designing this. Um, so obviously, you can you can see different things. You can you can click on them to view them. What am I looking at now? Funny. I spent a lot of time in the subreddit, so you can see the thumbnailings working. So everything's looking pretty good. You can see this nice little overlay here. We can access the comments. So as a, as a Reddit viewer, no offense, Mike, who also built a Reddit viewer, this is pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> now what I do is I'm going to take the window over here and I'm going to resize it. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to first of all show how to log in. So note how when you log in, it shows this overlay and it takes up the full size of the phone, uh, the full size of the screen. Now when I resize it to the size of the desktop, you can see how it breaks out. And now I have the, the list on the left side, so I can, I can browse through the list. Um, and the contents on the right. Now, logging in, the overlay looks more like a dialog box. Um, it doesn't take up the full size of the window. So, obviously, the convergence is not just the overall app, but it's just the, the independent components as well. So, now I'm logging in to Reddit, and I can browse. Um, and when I select an item, the content appears on the right. And again, you see this little overlay at the bottom. Uh, where you can access the comments if you want. Um, neatly, if you want to upvote, you slide it to the left, you slide the item to the left, and if you want to downvote, you slide the item to the right as well. Now, again, this is all from the same code base. So, for the same code base, it detects the size of the, essentially the size of the, the, the screen that it's running on, and the layout can adjust to phone, tablet, TV, desktop, However you, however you prefer. So it provides a really, really nice way of building applications that run across all of these different devices. And as we saw with, 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 um, with Daniel and, and Martin's demo as well, getting these into the store is really easy as well. So a big chunk of the, of the focus is going to be moving forward, getting people to, to converge across these different devices. Many of the core apps converge across these different devices. Um, and you'll, you'll see a lot more of that in the next cycle. Yeah, so, so it's as 1404's SDK improvements happen, that app will start to look more like a traditional type yeah. desktop when it's that big. Okay. Yeah, I mean most of most of it's working pretty good for running running apps on the desktop, but in 1404 we want to make it easier for people to be able to test out click click packages, and to fix any remaining integration issues. Okay. Um, so, so. Without further ado, again, let's move on to our final demo, uh, George. Uh, George Castro has been, uh, you know, anyone who knows what Juju is will know who George is. Uh, George does a remarkable job building uh, motivation, excitement, and participation around, around Juju, which is a really awesome cloud orchestration technology. Um, There's been a, a, a large number of improvements in the Juju world. George is, showing the, is, is going to be showing the, the, the Juju GUI as an example. So, George, yep. do you want to kick off and explain what, first of all, kick off for those people who don't know what Juju is, explain what it is, sure. why people do that, and then maybe you can show us how it works. Sure. Um, so, Juju in, in, in 140 characters or less is basically getting your stuff running in the cloud as fast and as easy as possible. Um, and by stuff, we mean services that people use in the cloud. Um, so, things like databases, services, um, like your wikis, your WordPresses, anytime um, a user loads something up 
in their web browser, there's a server on that back end that's doing a bunch of work. Um, since Ubuntu is really popular in the cloud, we, we started to see um, places where we could improve to make deploying things into clouds much easier. And thus began Juju, which I'm going to show off today. Um, but the best way to do it is probably by example. So I'm going to do that, and I'm going to use the same cats um, a meme that Daniel started there. So, assuming that um, that Daniel made a cat's web page or cat's application, it's already in the Ubuntu store. He's going to need things for his for his cat empire. So, um, Juju is a tool for system administrators. Now, what I'm going to show you here is the is the um, CLI and the GUI itself. The GUI the GUI kind of helps you visualize a lot of things. So, I'm just going to show you how quickly and easy it is for Daniel to set up a website for his cat application. So um, let's start off with WordPress, which is a pretty popular um, blogging software. He's going to need that. So we're going to deploy this here in our little canvas. And I'm going to explain to you what's happening here in a minute. Um, but let's just get a blog up and running really quick. Um, and a blog needs a database. So what I'm doing here is I'm kind of putting together Lego blocks. Ignore this Juju GUI block here. Um, now what this is doing is, in the background, Juju is actually configured in this case to deploy things to Amazon Web Services, uh, which provides an API for you to launch services. So what's happening right now is two machines are being spawned on Amazon Web Services right now. Uh, one is installing WordPress, and one is installing MySQL. Uh, the great thing is that these services are run by scripts called charms, and these charms are contributed to us by our community. Um, so just give you a list of things that are available here, MySQL, uh, Rails. Let me just show you all of them here. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that you can deploy. So even, even uh, if you can't find what I'm uh, talking about, you can just do a search in the store if you're interested to see what's in there. So what we're doing here is we're automating a bunch of the stuff that normally used to take um, multiple steps to do manually, right? You would have to find an AMI, you would launch it in your cloud, or in, your, or in the case of hardware, you'd have to physically find a server, get an Ubuntu CD, install the OS on it, and, and do all this kind of stuff. Then finally SSH in, install WordPress, right? Uh, install MySQL, link them all together, um, and this is, this is the problem that Juju sets out to fix. Um, I'm not really manually uh, doing anything except dragging boxes into my little workspace here, and Juju does all the work. Um, however, in, in order to make a uh, working web service, uh, these services need to talk to each other. So with Juju, we can add relationships between these, um, uh, between these services. So normally what happens if you install WordPress and MySQL, there's manual steps, and if you've done WordPress before, you've seen this on their website. Um, of all the tables you need to create in MySQL and things like that. And this is all handled by the charms. And what's great about these charms is because they're community contributed, I can take and reuse these. And the WordPress charm is, is really slick. It runs really fast with caching with Nginx and things like that. So th this allows me to um, uh, just randomly deploy things that I need for my, uh, for my application. So assuming it's my cat application, um, I'm going to want a wiki as well, I think. For my users, so they can they can um, uh, fill out help information about my cat application. And I'm going to reuse the database here. See, I'm really um, I'm deploying WordPress now. I'm deploying MediaWiki. I have a database already. Um, I might as well deploy that. And you can do all sorts of services that we have available in the store. So my users will need a forum. So I'm going to grab Marco Cheppi's Discourse Forum charm. I'm going to deploy that. And that's just going to fire off. And, and you can see here the yellow means uh, things are still happening in the background, and green means it's ready. Um, but I'm just going to start to fire things off here. Um, and this needs a database here. We have got a great PostgreSQL charm um, that does a lot of load balancing. Um, and we're going to go ahead and kind of design my little um, my little deployment here. Now, all the things that you normally would read on the website on how to install and configure these services, um, Juju allows 
uh, sysadmins and DevOps to kind of put that stuff uh, into a charm and then put it in the store. So if I have a custom Rails application, for example, that I want to deploy, I can define my Git branch um, in this Rails app itself um, as a configuration option if I would like, uh, which is in here somewhere. Here it is. You could put your GitHub repo there, and then we can build a relation to the database there. And then this term will actually go to GitHub, grab your Rails application, and deploy it on the spot, which is really nice. Um, so these services are firing up in just, just a few notes here. Um, everything I'm doing here is live. This is actually fired up and being deployed. Um, the, the nice thing about Juju is it makes it so easy and fast to deploy things that it's almost easier to deploy things in real life than, than to tell you uh, in a demo how it works. So as these services come up, they'll turn green, and I'll be able to go to the URL on AWS and have these services up and running. Um, so the idea with Juju is if you're on HP Cloud, if you're on Amazon, on your own hardware or your own OpenStack, you can deploy this GUI itself. This GUI is also uh, free software. Um, and have this kind of power on your own local services at work, right? So when your boss is like, I really want to get a WordPress op blog up and running right now, you can just fire it off, drag the boxes like I just did, um, wait a few minutes for those to come up, and then you're done. Um, and that's basically it. These services will come up. Uh, the cloud is fast, but not too fast. It takes about five, five to seven minutes uh, for these instances to come up. Uh, so that really, uh, I don't know if you want to, Talk about something else, we can come back to me and I can show you the working green boxes or if you just want to believe me. Um, but either way, that's Juju. We have uh, over 130 services in the store ready to deploy today. Um, and uh, that's basically it. Unless I have any questions. All right. Thank you, George. Uh, well, we've only got a minute left, so I'm not sure if we're going to have time. Let me just take a quick look over the... Uh, the channel, see if we can we can squeeze any quick questions in. We do have a few. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can blast through each of these quickly. First of all, Cheeseburg, I see that there is a field to choose required hardware. This will be from the app developer um, side of things. Will this be automated by the SDK at some point? So if the app uses the gyroscope feature, it will be automatically required in the description without me having to manually add it. Yes. Same for the uh, version number and so on. Uh, we're even working on um, making it so that in the SDK you can say, upload this app to the store, and that's going to be it. Like you're going to get immediate feedback. That's the plan. Perfect. Simon K asks, uh, where is the best place to ask questions about developing an Ubuntu SDK app? My case is I have a problem. Which component should I use? So I can probably take that to a degree. Um, Obviously, developer.ubuntu.com is, is, is designed to be the, the place where you can engage with building apps for Ubuntu. Um, there are a number of links on there to ask Ubuntu, uh, where, where, where questions can be tagged. Uh, so for example, if you, if you ask a question about QML, you can tag it with QML. Um, and then the benefit of asking on Ask Ubuntu is, first of all, there's a, an awesome community of people there. But the second thing is that questions that uh, have really good answers um, that get accepted, we can then promote into the cookbook on developer.bunju.com. So it means that that question will then be reusable and re-readable by other people as well. Um, but uh, the Ubuntu app developer community on, um, on Google Plus is a great place to ask questions as well. But I'd always recommend you go to developer.bunju.com first. Um, next question, Simon K. What is the status about printing from the phone? As far as I'm aware, that hasn't been started yet, so you can't print from the phone. Um, Cheeseburg, since desktop elements are coming to the SDK for the 1404 cycle, does that mean Flip packages are coming to Unity 7 and or will there be a preview for Unity 8 desktop session? No. Uh, click packages will not be being able to download click packages officially in like wide production will not be available for Unity 7. The reason why is because Unity 7 depends on X um, and uh, click packages run using um, application confinement, which means that there isn't a full code review of click packages. Um, as such, we require all of the application confinement pieces to be running. 
95% of those pieces are running on a on a Unity 7 system, uh, apart from um, apart from the fact that when X is running, there are some security um, limitations within X, which means that, for example, keyboard events can be sniffed. That's solved by Mir. So on the phone, it works fine because we ship Mir. So the full full security is in place. But what we are planning on doing in the 1404 cycle is trying to make it easier for people to be able to run click packages and understand those security limitations so people can test them out. Um, um, there was another side to that question. Yeah, so, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Cheeseburg, can Juju be used on home servers? I know nothing about creating or setting a WordPress server, but this looks awesome and simple for a new user. George, do you want to say that? Uh, yeah, we are working on a manual uh, provider to allow you to deploy to any server with uh, SSH. Um, however, that did not make their release probably a month or two. Um, if you're interested in trying it out, ping me on IRC, and I can almost get it working for you. But we're we're pretty close. But no, as of now, you need like a real cloud. Well, there's also LXC if you just want to uh, try it out locally, right? Yeah, but the problem is, is um, you get into networking issues right away if you want to serve pages from your blog to the rest of your network, for example. Um, so the, the local stuff is more for your, like your local development of your, your web app and stuff. But that's also a place where we can make some improvements to make that suck less for people. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I know a few, a few of the guys had to drop off because they had to get off to meetings. Um, even though 1310 is out, um, we ain't resting. So we got a, we got a mission to build this uh, ubiquitous OS. Uh, that brings freedom to, um, to, uh, to technology across all of your devices and in the cloud and the server as well. So the, the, the fight continues, my friends. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for joining us today. 1310 is a really good release. I think we're all super proud of it. We're all absolutely exhausted. Uh, so don't be surprised if you don't see... Um, if you see like people missing from IRC a little bit over the next couple of days, because some people are going to be taking a while and rest. But um, thank you for joining us today. Um, and uh, remember, this video is going to be available on YouTube on the Ubuntu on Air channel. Um, thank you also to Jose for, for, for setting up the session and, and for taking care of the scheduling and all the rest of it. Um, Jose has been fundamental in, in, in setting up uh, Ubuntu on Air. So many thanks to, to him as well. So thank you, everyone. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Bye.